This morning, we're going to be talking about uh, a, a young, uh, not a young lady, but a lady named Tabitha in Scripture, that Scriptures hold up as this example to all of us, what it looks like to be people of service. Let me see, can we get our slides up here? There we go. Okay. All right, now we're, now we're in business. But I, uh, I, got a, I got a story to tell you. When I was a college pastor, I was a college pastor for a lot of years, and I used to love to take mission groups. And I'd take mission groups to international places. We went to Juarez, Mexico. We went all over the globe. Um, and then we'd also go to big inner cities. And there was a, a church that I got hooked up with that I partnered with in Dallas, Texas. In Dallas, Texas, it was a church called Cornerstone there, and it was on, anybody from Texas? Some of you, I know that Texans are always everywhere. They're in every crowd you go to. Um, but there's this corner in Dallas, Texas called Martin Luther King Boulevard. It is known as one of the most deadly corners in all of the state of Texas. There's been more gang battles, more gang fights, more gang deaths in this one block radius and here's little old Shane going with, uh, I originally went as a student with a bunch of Wyoming kids, never been in a big city, and we're going to inner city Dallas. And I'm like super young, I'm like, what am I getting into, right? I'm a Wyoming boy to the core. And it's like, so Wyoming kid coming to this big city, and I look around, and I remember the first night we got to Dallas, Texas with our group of students. Uh, we go to call the pizza guy. And I'm like, hey, can we get some pizza delivered to this house? The, the church had owned a big white house that they put mission teams up into. And the, <laughs> he's like, okay, well, what's your address? And I said, well, here's the address. It's on Martin Luther King Boulevard. He goes, <laughs> we don't go there in the day. We're definitely not going there after dark. And I was like, oh, no. What have I gotten myself into? But as, as I went that first time, uh, my guitar was stolen out of our church van. It was, it was a hard missions trip. And about the middle of the week, we were discouraged. Our team was sick. We were, had things stolen. Um, I think at one point there was a catalytic converter cut off our van. Like it's just, it's, it was a hard, hard trip. But in the middle of the week, we felt defeated, and we just, we huddled up in this little white house, and we began to be pray, Lord Jesus, would you take back this neighborhood? Lord Jesus, would you go to war for this neighborhood? And something broke that night. In tears, we dropped to our knees and prayed for this neighborhood, and the next morning, we sensed something was different. The Holy Spirit began to empower us to serve this community. And we partnered with this church. I ended up partnering with this church now for almost 15 some years. Many of the people, we, I'd go every year for spring break. I'd lead college students there. And there are so many stories about what a church that is service-minded for the sake of Christ can do to an entire community. Because this was once the most deadly corner in Dallas, but I saw this church year after year begin to set up shop, begin to work. They would buy back local houses. They would restore them. They would make them halfway houses. They would start addictions programs and discipleship programs. And they rolled up their sleeves and they began to get to work for the namesake of Jesus. And that neighborhood to this day is changed. I can walk there now comfortably during the day when I go and I visit all of the many relationships and friendships that I've made. Because when a church catches the vision that the word of God paired with the deeds of God's people can change a community, can change a community. And so church, I want to call for us um, another quick story. I just want to share with you really quick. I remember we would sit at this white house uh, with, with all of our college students. And I remember about the third year we went, there was houses across the street from where we would stay. And we would stay in this house and you could look across the street and you would see sex trafficking. And there was nothing we could do. You would look across the street and you'd see prostitution and you see drug houses and there was nothing we could do, but there was something we could do. We sat on that porch and we pleaded with God for those three houses. God, give over those three houses. They're strongholds for the enemy and for sin. We pray, God, that you would give those three houses to this church. You know what happened? All three of those houses were given over to the church. 
two years later. And not only that, here it gets crazier, right? A service-oriented church, they call us back and they're like, they're like, okay, well, we got these houses. God answered our prayers. Let's get to restoring them. And I got to go in and I got to tear these houses down to the studs and pray out the darkness. And we got to then, another year later, we got to see them completely restored. And they became baby houses, houses for young pregnancy teen, uh, teens and crisis pregnancies. They became ed places of education and discipleship. They became resources for the church. And those three houses that were once used in darkness and for sex trafficking, we got to see turned into kingdom building houses for the church in this area. That's what happens when a church can catch the vision for service ministry. Because it means gritty work. At one time when we were cleaning out one of those houses, there was over 27 different toilets in, in, the, in the basement that we had to pick up and we had to clean out. I don't want to know what those were used for. But you know what? The gritty, dirty work, getting our hands dirty, began the process of the kingdom, working through and retaking back that neighborhood. They've started grocery stores, halfway houses, discipleship programs, and so, guys, today I want to talk about what it means for a church to be service-oriented or for us personally. Some of you here today are service-oriented. You like to do something with your hands in such a way that you can see the difference at the end of the day. Any, amen? Anybody like that? Um, so we've been going through a series that we're calling What's My Style? What's My Style? We're asking the question, what type of personality strengths did God give you and to me to make disciples? See, we are given this thing called the Great Commission. Everybody say the Great Commission. Great. I like you guys got the inflection there. And the Great Commission is not just a command for us to do, but it's something he both tells us to do and he equips us to do it. So everybody sitting here this morning, if you're drawing breath, you are equipped to make disciples as Jesus has created you to do. Does that make sense? And each of you are uniquely gifted. There is no other you. Turn to your neighbor and said, I'm the only me. Okay. I know that might have been weird, right? But thank goodness you're unique because God created you with a unique personality, unique gifting, so that for the purpose of changing this world by making disciples, some of you may be uniquely gifted in the area of service uniquely gifted in the area of service. And so was, uh, so was Tabitha. So today, guys, we're talking about service. And I want to give you a quote um, from the great theologian Gandalf. Uh, I'm kidding. He was. Uh, but some believe it is only great power that can hold evil in check. But that is not what I have found. I have found that it is the very small, everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. Small acts of kindness and love. This is what Jesus calls us to. The thing about service ministry, we talked about friendship ministry. You guys remember what we said requires, friendship ministry requires this thing called intentionality. We have to make friends on purpose. Anybody like accidentally stumbling into making really close good friends? Not usually. Usually you have, to, you have to be intentional. Well, for us to be a service-oriented church, we have, to, we have to pair it with initiative. Everybody say initiative. And what does initiative mean? Initiative means you don't wait for somebody to say, hey, man, you need to do that, or here's how it's going to work. You take the initiative to do it on your own. Guys, you know how we could unlock this church as a service-oriented church? is if you didn't just wait for the pastor to come up with a cool program. What if you saw a need and you met a need? What if you went after the community with the heart of Christ? And see, this is what we see in Tabitha as we read through here. Um, so, oh, I want to show you a couple pictures. So here are some of the teams that I took to Dallas. Um, here is Pastor Chris, and this is actually my mentor and his mentor. So you got three generations of discipleship there. Uh, we like to consider it the Timothy uh, Barnabas um, kind of relationship, right? 
Um, you see, there's my, my wife. We made so many close friends that we keep up with even today. And if we have time at the end, I'll show you a video that has those three houses in it. But we're going to be in the book of Acts today, Acts 9. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Acts. Acts 9, we're going to be looking at verse 36. Acts 9, 36. And starting there in verse 36 in the ESV, now there was in Joppa a disciple this is kind of some, some cool facts about Joppa here. Joppa is about to be the place where Peter is sent out to the Gentiles, right? Shortly after this passage, Jonah was also sent out from the same port, from the same place. You guys know the story of Jonah? And who is he sent out to? Ninevites. There's my Bible people, the Ninevites, right? And so both of them were people that the, those being sent to were not huge fans of, right? So Joppa's a port where God sent two men to people that they didn't care for. Um, and so then here we see, as we begin this passage, now there was in Joppa a disciple. Everybody say disciple. So a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. You can giggle a little bit. I have a hard time as as an ex-youth pastor not laughing at that Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. So I, I put yellow here, disciple. This is a really important distinction because this is the only place in the Bible where, uh, where a woman in particular is given this title of disciple. So here, Luke, who's the author of the book of Acts, is saying, I want to use Tabitha as an example of who a disciple is, more in particular, what a a female, a woman disciple looks like. Now, we have indicators that the word disciple, when they use it uh, in different places, women were, of course, considered a part of the disciples that Jesus had at the time. It was first the 12 and 72, and then we know that there were more disciples, and we know women were a part of that group. But this is the only case in scripture where this specifically calls out a single woman, Tabitha. So this is important. This is where we should take note. Luke wants us to see her as an example to the whole church, not just to other women, but to the whole church, that she would be an example of a disciple. Her name was Tabitha, or, uh, and this says, which translated means Dorcas. To you and me, we don't know what that means. Why is it translated Dorcas? But it actually means gazelle. And I love this because she was abounding in good works and charity. See what we did there? Okay. You guys following with me? Okay, good. We're having fun with scriptures today. Okay. So Tabitha, gazelle, she abounded in good works and acts of charity. Um, It reminds me of a passage in Proverbs. Many of you women will know Proverbs 31, 20 through 21, where Solomon's talking about the incredible woman of Proverbs 31. He says in verse 20, she opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow. We know snow is coming, right? She is not afraid of snow for her household for all her household were clothed in scarlet. And so when Solomon is thinking about this woman, he's projecting, he's thinking about, you know, man, this, this woman Tabitha maybe someday would be a fitting of that Proverbs 31. All right? So let's see here. So let's talk, let's talk briefly. If Tabitha is an example to us today about someone who is gifted in service ministry, let's talk about then what are we called to as believers? All believers, believe it or not, are called to good works. We read that in our memory verse, right? In Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for TV watching, Sitting in football stands. No. Right? Having chips on the couch. No. We were created for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. (laughs) I love that. Every day, good works is like an Easter egg hunt for us. Because you can count on, because of that passage, every day you walk into 
Today, God has prepared for me good works that I might walk in them. So every day becomes an adventure of discovery. Do you wake up like that? (laughs) You just think about it like, oh man, God, what in the world have you prepared for me today to walk in? But that's the attitude that we as believers get to have because we know our Father in heaven has prepared for us good works to walk in. It's like kids at Christmas. Every day gets to be Christmas for a believer. Oh God, I cannot wait to unwrap for what you have for me today. So as we, as we continue to talk about good works, we got to establish that God has both prepared those good works for us. So this idea of intentionality is that we see a need and we meet a need. When we're trying to train our, ki- our kids, you ever try to tr- train teenagers to see something that they just kind of have these like blinders up on? I know adults, you don't have any blinders on ever, do you? Right? And, and it's funny, it's like you can have kids and, and like things that you see all over the floor, like Legos and socks and shoes that they just kind of like trip over while they're walking through. And they're like, did you see what you, you're trying to tell them? Did you see what you just tripped on? And like, I didn't see anything. Looks clean to me, dad. But it's like they have these blinders on, right? Well, for us, I think many of us as believers have these blinders on. We're like, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to keep on my trajectory. I don't want to see any messes that I'm going to have to roll up my sleeves and get caught up into. Oh, you guys know, you fight it every time you drive by that, that person with the sign that says help, don't you? Anybody else wrestle with that? You're like, oh God, I'm going to have this wrestling match. Like, should I take my blinders down now? What should I do? They're asking for stuff and I don't know if I'm going to be able to help them. And so we all do this wrestling match that we, we see it, but do we want to see it? Oh man, we, should, we wrestle with that. We want to train like we're trying to train our kids to see the trash and not wait for somebody else to clean it up, but for us to take responsibility. Church, Tabitha, as we're going to read, took responsibility Uh, She took responsibility. Now, there was in Joppa, again, so good works. She was full of good works and acts of charity. Nobody had to come to her and say, hey, here's a good idea. You should do this. She did this in her own volition. In her own volition. What if we were driven people? Because Jesus poured out his grace on us. Grace, grace. Why would we not be people who turn around and abundantly pour out grace into others? whether they deserve it or not. <clears throat> so for us, church, we got to stop having this attitude that we're going to wait for someone else to clean things up. What if we as a church adopt the city of Riverton in Fremont County? This is our home. This is our home. This is where God has placed us on purpose. What if we began to say, that trash on the ground, that's my responsibility. That's my responsibility. This community, when something goes wrong, that's my responsibility. That's my responsibility. Believers, we have that local responsibility that God gives us. We see that in the Old Testament. God's heart is that his people, though we're sojourners, this is our temporary home before we go and be with him in heaven, right? He encourages the early Israelites to do what? To work for the benefit of, of the land that they're living in. You know what land they were living in? They were in captivity. They were in bondage. They're like around real sinful people. And here God is encouraging the Israelites to build a life and to work for the benefit of their captors. I know sometimes today, none of you feel like you're a a captor to some of the culture today, right? That's just not true. I think some of us look around and we feel like, oh man, we're captive to what's going on. But that's just something that we can do is take on that responsibility. And by the way, I think many of us wait for another Christian organization to pop up so that we can give to that Christian organization. That's not what Tabitha is talking about. She didn't wait for World Vision to tell her how she was going to serve. She served, right? Right? And so us, not always waiting for an organization, but instead taking responsibility now. Tabitha was of good works. She self-initiated. That means being creative in how we serve the community. 
Man, there were so many things that we did in Dallas. At one time, we got there and they were like, we don't know what else you can do. And so we grabbed uh, some wheelbarrows and just walked around and picked up trash in the neighborhood. And what if life groups just got a wild hankering every once in a while and was like, hey, today's service day. Instead of sitting here and talking, we're going to go serve our community in the name of Jesus. Life groups, there's your challenge. You don't have to do it every time. But man, man. Um, Another thing that we need to remember is that good works don't save us. The Bible is absolutely and abundantly clear that we don't do good works to earn salvation. So it's not like if I do this, God's going to like me more because I'm doing good works. The Bible is really clear that we go out and do acts of charity and goodness because Jesus did goodness to us. It's an overflow. It's a side effect of receiving grace that we go out and we serve others because Jesus first served us. It's kind of like this, the motivation for us doing good works. I always think about if I were to show up to our front door and I had flowers and I knock on the door and Becky answers, hey, darling. She answers and I go, honey, I heard, I read somewhere that you're supposed to get your wife flowers. And so I grabbed the cheapest ones I could find. Here you go. Okay, see you later. Get my checkbook out here. It's just like, check, got wife flowers. Yeah. How do you think Becky's going to respond in that situation? She might take her shoe off and throw it at my face, right? She should if I did that, right? That's not a very good motivation for giving her flowers. But here's, when we do good works, well, let's rewind the scenario. And I show up at my front door and Becky's there. And I say, "Hun, I scoured the store and I found your favorite flower. And I've watered it. It's ranunculus. I even know her favorite flower. Guys, taking notes. Okay. I scoured this store to find the right flower and I found it. It's the perfect color and I cannot wait to give it to you. I have this card and and I want to take you out on a date and I just want to be with you. I'm so excited to give this to you. How do you think my reception is going to be if I did something like that? (laughs) Yeah, I might. It's like, it's going to be a good date, right? It's going to be a good date. She's going to be happy about that. Guys, God desires from us, not sacrifice, but a willing heart, a worshipful heart, a heart of love towards him. And he tells us this. He wants a heart that is in love with him. And that's why we do good works. That's our motivation for making him renowned because we love our Lord. There's a big difference in a motivator, isn't it? How many of you do stuff because you have to? Man, everybody's like, if my boss is in here, I don't want to have them see me raising my hand, right? But, But there's a difference in how you do your work if you have to versus if you get to. If you get to, it changes how you do it, doesn't it? See, that's the good works that we get to walk in with Jesus Christ. It's no longer a have to. Now it's a, oh, Jesus, I get to. I can't wait to see what you prepared for me. Tabitha understood this. And we have passages like James 2, 14 through 18. So again, we cannot earn our salvation, but James asks a really hard question in James 2, 14 through 18. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have good works, it's dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. And here's what James says. And I will show you my faith by my works. 
James, if you go to verse 26, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So James here, James here is not saying that we're saved by our works, but our works, when we are motivated with a love motivation in the Lord, it's what we're going to do naturally. It's what we're going to do. See, because we have a faith that changes us. It changes our desire. It changes our pursuit. It changes our purpose for living. That's the gospel. And so if our faith is genuine, James is making the argument, if our faith is genuine, then we're going to want and desire to serve Jesus in word and in deed, in word and in deed. So good works, literally speaking here, good works uh, that Tabitha is labeled with, if you want to get the understanding for the meaning of these words, good works and acts of charity. It literally means alms or gifts to the poor. That's the acts of charity. That means alms or gifts to the poor. I immediately, as I was preparing for this Sunday, I was thinking about the piles and their ministry. It's a tough ministry, isn't it, guys? But man, it's a ministry full of love to the Lord. It's a ministry filled with love to the Lord. And, and by the way, church, do you know they invite us to kind of help them out with that? You haven't really done hard ministry or good ministry until you've given yourself an opportunity to sit down and to serve sometimes the lowliest of the lowly. And the piles are inviting you to join that, right, Miriam? <laughs> Sunday, October 23rd. All right, church. Your neighbors. I think about this. How many of us, if we're we're known for good works, just go and uh, we know snow is coming. And I know for a fact that there are some who can't shovel their walks around you, huh? Well, I know some of you live out in the boonies and the deer really don't need their walks shoveled. But... Maybe come in town with a shovel, ready to serve, to, sh- to, to shovel walks, bake bread. Some of you are gifted in these acts of service. Really, it's kind of like being a good human. So the example of Tabitha is that we would be a good human being. I used to do this thing in high school. We called it acts uh, or random acts of kindness. And what if you scheduled in for your family, guys, uh, dads and moms? Here's a really cool practice. What if you scheduled in a once a month or even once a week Random act of kindness where you as a family did something, wrote notes, you know, went out and gave a gift card to someone. What if, what if you planned something as a family where you did a random act of kindness? You want to know where you can find people to serve? Go to Walmart and just walk around and pray, God, would you give me a moment to be kind to somebody here in Walmart? I guarantee Walmart's going to notice because I don't know if you've noticed, but people in Walmart are not very happy. Am I right? They're not happy to be there, but what if believers were there randomly acting, we know randomly, not randomly, because Jesus has prepared those good works before us. But what if we went out and did some random acts of kindness as families, as life groups? Building three. Oh, so um, one of the things that I got to do, again, as a college minister, is we built, over, we built three houses in Juarez, Mexico. I took my three-year-old kids to Juarez, Mexico and serve with us. My three-year-old twins running around. I got pictures of them running around with me in Juarez, Mexico, as we're building, raising this house for a family. I'll tell you, there was no greater joy than the day I get to give keys to a young family in Juarez, Mexico. Well, they're weeping. And I got to say, I'm giving this house to you in Jesus' name. It's not me. It's Jesus is the reason I'm giving you this house. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Man, hey, by the way, there are probably some of those trips coming up because that's a real passion of mine, church, and I want to invite you to join me in going and serving, serving the nations and serving our local community. So we got acts of charity, um, and obviously not expecting anything in return because our reward is in heaven, right? So we do these things as to the Lord. Um, we live in an age of marketing philanthropy. Anybody noticed how big companies really like to be seen for giving lots of money. So there's like this marketing philanthropy. We don't want to be like that. 
In some cases, I think we should serve and do it in a way that we're not seen. Boy, that's really going to challenge your sense of pride, isn't it? Do something that you get no prayer, no praise for, and then watch your flesh boil up. I dare you. So good works. Um, so let's read here the, the rest of the passage. Um, in those days, she became ill. So Tabitha, who's of this incredible rapport, becomes ill, and she died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in the upper room. Since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. And then I want you to see here that she was radically missed, radically missed by the local peoples. Uh, verse 39, so Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. And what was his reception? All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. So you notice that there was great weeping in the widows, right? All the widows stood beside him weeping and, and this crazy thing, showing tunics and other garments that she had made. There's this crazy principle, church, when we serve, we make relationships. When you serve people, you begin to, there's this like crazy thing that you begin, that begins to well up in you is when you serve the least of these, you begin to love them. I'm going to let that sink for a minute. Because there's, there's a, a lot of absence and we are, we're really good as a society about talking about people and judging people that we've never met or talked to at our dinner table. But you know what? When you serve them, you wash their feet as our Savior washed his disciples' feet. You know what happens? This love begins to well up inside of you. And you begin to make long lifelong friendships and relationships. I want to introduce you. Last year, I got to go see my brother and James. Brother James was a good friend of mine, and I told him to watch today. I called him this week. Uh, this was last year. His health was rough, and he's a beloved brother of mine. I look forward every year to going and seeing my brother James. And he was there the first year that we went to the, the Dallas area, and every year we rejoice to talk with one another. And this year, last year, he was in the hospital. And so I got to go visit with him and pray with him. Brothers, Brother James is very, very dear to me. But you know what? It's because I went to that area and I served. See, brothers and sisters, we sometimes wonder, why don't we have deep relationships? And Jesus gives us passages like, well, serve one another. And we get so busy in our day-to-day -day or at work that we forget that the very thing that Jesus gave us to do is the thing that's going to help us no longer be lonely. I have friends in Brazil. I have friends in Juarez. I have friends all over the globe because God sent me to go serve. <clears throat> so this is Brother James, and I have a deep friendship with him. And I want to ask the question then with us, brothers and sisters, if the church disappeared today from Riverton, if this church building closed up shop, we put a, a door or a, a closed sign on the door, I got a question for you. Would the community miss us? Would they notice that we were even gone? Or have we spent so much time focusing and trying to get as much as we can out of church, that we've made it about us. There's a real danger in that today, isn't there, church? But Tabitha, she was greatly missed. And see, we want to be a service-oriented church, not for accolades, but that's just a measurement. If we, if we disappear today, it should break our hearts, this idea that nobody would notice us being gone. It means that we're not doing what God called us to do in service, in love, and in good works. Acts 20, 35, in all things I have shown you, so this is Paul, in all things I have shown you that you 
that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. The words of the Lord Jesus. Are you ready? How he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That is radically different than what this world and what this culture is promising you. You're going to try to receive your whole life and you're going to feel empty. But man, when you begin to start to give, I think you're going to be surprised by what God is going to fill you up with. The relationships that we gain when we go and we serve, there's a tale of three James. I introduced one James to you, but there's another James that I met while we served. And this was a younger James who was a sixth grader when I was there and we shared the gospel with him. He came to Christ. He, he grew up to be a very big guy and he played football. And it was my favorite thing to take my students to go visit him. You know why? Because this huge guy with a massive afro would come up and he would run towards me and grab me and give me a huge hug. And my students thought we were being mugged. <laughs> they looked at me and they're like terrified. And then, and then they realized, oh my goodness, like this guy loves this guy. And it was like, yes, this is my other brother, James. And then there was a third James as I served in Dallas who began to do construction with us alongside. And I got to watch him walk through recovery and develop a, a, a statewide construction company um, that he's still now doing well in. Because I got to walk with him and serve with him. All of those men are dear to me. They're like brothers. This is what happens when we serve. Mark 10, 29, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is... No one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children or lands for my sake or for the gospel who will not receive. This is a promise of God, he says, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. What is Jesus's what is Jesus' promise there in Mark 10, 29? He's saying that if you're persecuted for the sake of Jesus, awesome. If you've lost somebody in your life because of the sake of Jesus and you pursuing him, I am going to give you back a hundredfold. Well, what is he saying? What's the hundredfold? Some of you are like, my family won't talk to me because I'm a Christian. That feels like a major loss. You know what the promise is? Look around. Here's the promise. Hundredfold. I bet you there's a hundred people in here that God says, this is my gift to you for following me. This is the church. This is the gift that he's given us today. It says now in this time, the church is a gift, brothers and sisters. I know many of you understand that and know that. I want to keep reading here, but Peter put them all aside. So he files all of the, the weeping widows out and he knelt down and prayed and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. I've actually been to the Joppa port. And to this day, there's a little house uh, that says Simon the Tanner. It's total garbage. It's not actually the original Simon the Tanner's house. But um, this was a real place. And I want you to see my last point of the day is this. There should be a marriage between service and the gospel. There are many camps today that have tried to separate the two. But I want you to see here, when Tabitha's life lived in service was paired with her resurrection from death to life, what happens? The whole city knew Jesus. They were like, whoa. See, when we marry our service to gospel sharing and to renown, like making renown the name of Jesus, those two things together are powerful. But there's camps over here that say we have to shut up and we can't, we can't speak the gospel and we can't talk about Jesus. You just got to do good things. And then there's a camp over here that says, oh man, you don't want to serve those people. They're difficult. And you know what? It's better just to tell them about the Bible and, and give them a Bible and tell them about the gospel and don't do anything for them. 
And the Bible here clearly says, you cannot divorce those two. They ought always occur together. Brothers and sisters, when we engage in good works, it's for the sake of the gospel. It's because of the gospel that we do good works. And so we want people to know that when we serve them, it's about Jesus, it's not about us. It's because we were first loved that we can go out and love. We're not just about social justice, but we're about kingdom justice. We don't want to be people who just give people a cold cup of water all the way to hell. But we want to be people that give it to them and plead with them. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And he says, my arms are open to all who would profess that I am Lord and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead. That's what our scriptures tell us. Brothers and sisters, we cannot part service and the gospel. There should always be a why for what you do in Jesus' name, because Jesus loved me first. I want to leave you with a passage in scripture. If you don't take my word for it, take Jesus's word for it. Matthew 25, 31 through 41. This is one of the most challenging verses, I believe, in the Bible. And I just want to read it to you, Matthew 25. If you got your Bibles, I'm not going to put it up on the screen. I want you to use your physical Bibles here. Matthew 25, 31 through 41. And I'll even put that passage up there for you. Matthew 25, 31 through 41. It says this, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all of the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him. So this is the return of Jesus, and He will separate them one from another. Just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. And then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And here's what Jesus said. Verse 35, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Brothers and sisters, Curb your ear to this, verse 40, and the king will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will also say to those on the left, and and just for the sake of time, I'm not going to read this whole, but I want you to, to read verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And he goes through the same. I was hungry and you didn't give me anything to eat. Brothers and sisters, Jesus takes service very seriously. It's not going to earn our salvation, praise the Lord for that. But it is still his heart. And it is important to our Lord. And if we want to love what the Lord loves, and we want to seek after what he wants us to seek after, then let us pursue good works. So brothers and sisters, walk away with this. Serve. Would you serve? And would you serve to share? And don't wait. Be creative. See a need, meet a need. See a need, meet a need. Don't wait for somebody else. That's our community. Riverton is our community. Jesus has called us here now, today. Let's begin to serve this community in Jesus' name. Because the gospel is worth it. It should be carried on the back of good works. So life groups, I want to challenge you. 
Find a way in the next month to meet a need in the community as a group. Life group leaders, you got that? All right, let me pray for you. And brothers and sisters, I still have copies of the discipleship, Disciple Maker's Handbook if you'd like. Um, But let me pray for you and pray for me. Before I pray, if you're here and you're hearing the message that if I should just do more good things, then Jesus is going to love me more, that's a wrong message. And I hope never to preach that message to you. Because Jesus loves you and he welcomes you because of his death on the cross. He's made you right with God. And so it says in scripture, if you believe today, if you say, I believe you, Jesus, that you paid the price for my sin. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you put my sin, the wrath, the punishment that was due me in the grave. And you raised it to new life and you gave that righteousness to me. If you're willing to believe that and say that and pray that to the Lord, it says you will be saved. I want to invite you. You don't need anybody else to pray with you. You can do that right now where you're sitting. I would ask you if you do that, would you come talk to me? Because I want to celebrate what God has done. I want to rejoice that you have been moved from the, the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of what the Bible calls the beloved son, Jesus Christ. That, brothers and sisters, is salvation. I want to invite you to it. And if you're a Christian here today, I want to challenge you God has greater love for you to experience. To know firsthand, but to engage in that love, to experience that love, you have to serve. Lord Jesus, we pray that we would be a serving church. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would let go of the things that keep us from being joyous givers of our labors, of our time, of our resources. And God, I, I, we want to ask for forgiveness when we've done it just to be praised, when we do good things just to be praised, Lord, because we want to be less and we want you to be more. And so, Lord Jesus, we just pray, God, that you would be the motivator of our hearts to walk in the good works that you've prepared beforehand. Oh, Lord, I pray that you change this community because of your people in Jesus' name. Amen.